There are some historical mysteries that may never be solved, like the identity of Jack the Ripper, who built Stonehenge, and what happened on the Mary Celeste, and most perplexingly of all, why did the 90s arcade racer, an absolutely stunning looking Kickstarter project from over 10 years ago never get released? And even more perplexingly, why did everyone who worked on it suddenly start acting like it never existed in the first place? So let's you and me pull up a comfy chair and discuss whatever happened to the 90s arcade racer and look at the legacy of this game that never was. Back in 2013, a Greek artist known as Antonis Pelikanos announced a Kickstarter project to develop a game based on the old arcade racing games of his youth that he loved, called the 90s Arcade Racer. The plan was for this game to act as a love letter to the arcade racing games of old, in particular homaging the Sega Model 2 and Model 3 games from that particular time period like Daytona USA, Scud Race and Indy 500. The game easily surpassed its Kickstarter funding target and everything was looking rosy for a 2014 release. But in order to expand the game further, both in scope and in platform, Antonis, also known as Pelican 13, made a deal with the devil. The devil in this instance being indie game development studio Nicalis. Nicolas were a studio with an anti-Midas touch. Imagine instead of everything the CEO of Nicolas touching turning into gold, it turned instead into a little pile of shit. And despite the game appearing to be about 90% complete, it mysteriously evaporated into vaporware, with complete radio silence from all those involved as to why it just suddenly was seemingly canned. Now, before we get into too much speculation as to why the game was seemingly cancelled, I want to focus on just why the announcement of this game was such a big deal at this time, in particular to me, with, I'm sure, my reasons mirroring those of a lot of others, and why the fact it's never been released is still such a bitter pill to swallow, even today, 11 years later. Ever since I first became tall enough to reach the controls of an arcade cabinet as a kid, I've loved arcade racing games, which is funny because as an adult I don't especially have any real life love of cars, other than, you know, a passing interest in Formula 1, and a lifelong love of the Lamborghini Countach and the Ferrari Testarossa. But arcade racing games? Oh man, I love them. Something about the immediacy of them, the sense of speed and the adrenaline pumping gameplay, the nerve jangling sound effects and high tempo music just immediately clicked in my brain when I was a kid. And this love of driving games stayed with me as I moved into my teens and the games themselves became more advanced and moved across from 2D to 3D and started adding exciting new features like multiple different viewpoints, drifting and multiplayer. I can remember as a kid thinking, man, if this is what real life driving is like, real life driving must be awesome fun. But, as anyone who can drive will know themselves, driving a car in an arcade racing game bears absolutely no similarity to real life. Everything about an arcade racer is exaggerated, from the speed the cars go at, the way your vehicle moves left and right, the speed you can take corners at, and in some instances the way that you can also drift around corners at crazy speeds and have outlandish looking crashes that have no real impact on your vehicle's performance. They basically take aspects of real life driving and make them fun. And nowhere else was this sense of fun more highly emphasised than in Sega's arcade racing games of the 1990s. Games like the aforementioned Daytona USA, Scud Race, Sega Rally, Indy 500 
and OutRun 2 which came in the 2000s. Games that were not only immense fun to play, but also had a bold, brash, larger than life style about them too, with fantastical looking brightly coloured tracks, a style that went on to become known as Sega Blue Skies. It wasn't just Sega though, companies like Namco and their Ridge Racer series, Konami and their GTI Club games, and Midway with their Thunder series were also producing fun, fast and bombastic arcade racing games too. But then in 1997, Polyphony Digital released Gran Turismo for the PlayStation 1. Driving games that attempted realism had come before this, such as Hard Driving by Atari in 1988, and I'm sure there were more sim-type driving games on the PC, but Gran Turismo seemed to be the one that really captured the public consciousness and cemented the genre as a staple of mainstream gaming. When I very first saw the game running on the PlayStation 1, I was genuinely impressed with how good it looked, but when I tried playing it though, I just couldn't get into it. At this point, I didn't know that this was a new emerging genre. Back then, arcade racing games weren't really known as that, they were just racing games. And this particular racing game just felt wrong to me. The cars felt like they handled like tanks. You needed to slow down to almost a complete stop for every single corner you came to, otherwise the car would just go flying off the track every single corner. This meant that the gameplay felt slow as well. To me, it felt like adding the accurate driving physics and realism into this new style of sim racing gameplay had just sucked all the fun out. And believe me, I've genuinely tried so many times to get into driving sim games. I really have. I tried the Gran Turismo games on the PlayStation 1, the PlayStation 2 and the PS3, each time thinking, maybe this time the gameplay will finally click with me, but it just never has. And I'd end up ultimately just getting bored because they just don't feel like fun to me, especially with the unbelievably grinding nature of some of the challenges in some of them. I don't want to spend 50 plus hours pootling along some boring track, practicing my braking in a Ford Focus, not when I can just jump straight into a Ferrari F40 and outrun two and be power sliding next to a sunny, palm tree lined beach at 190 miles an hour. Over the years, I've tried some of the other sim racers out there as well, like Forza, Project Cars and Need for Speed Shift, but the net result is the same every time, I just find them tedious. Now, I feel like I should just whack in a huge industrial strength disclaimer here, to say that if you like them, that's fine. I've spoken to a fair few people in YouTube comments in the past who previously told me that they're a big fan of both arcade racers and sim racers. But they're just not for me though, alright? Now, beyond the simple fact that sim racers just don't feel any fun to play to me, another factor that makes me dislike them is that in their slavish devotion to realism, so many of them just look dull too. I saw a post on Reset Era the other day with a title that I thought summed this up quite amusingly. Remember Blue Sky Sega? Well say hello to Grey Sky Sony. Now don't confuse sim racers looking dull here for not looking good, from a purely technical standpoint at least. Modern sim racers like Gran Turismo 7 are near photorealistic now, with beautifully rendered cars and tracks that are anti-aliased, bloomed and gorad shaded up to the nines, all beautifully rendered in 4K at 60 frames per second as a minimum. Hell, even last generation I downloaded a Project Cars demo on my PS4 that even on that last generation hardware I thought was almost on the verge of looking like a real life race. Now, these modern sim racers may offer you a photorealistic version of Silverstone, Spa and Monza, but when you're actually playing them, they all just seem a bit, you know, samey, don't they? For all that realism, at the end of the day, you're still just on a regular racetrack, 
or in some instances, a slightly more interesting looking street circuit track. Sega's arcade racing titles of old, in comparison, always had interesting looking things going on around the track side. Daytona USA had the Sonic Ball and the giant interactive slot machine on its beginner track, the dinosaur fossils on its advanced stage, and the suspension bridge, weird tunnel thingy, space shuttle, sailing ship, an interactive statue of Jeffrey from Virtua Fighter on its expert stage. Once we got into the even more advanced Model 3 era and the graphics had improved further, things got even more outlandish in games like Scud Race, with a race that went through a huge drive through aquarium, a race through an airport at night time with planes flying overhead, and races through Aztec ruins and a castle. Daytona USA 2 ramped that batshit crazy factor up a notch further still, with a race inside a biodome, another set within an amusement park, complete with a swinging overhead pirate ship ride, a drive through a sci-fi haunted house, with a giant skull-headed spider alien attacking some UFOs, which also changed each lap, which then led into a post-apocalyptic looking area, with the wrecked subway train before exiting into another area with a working roller coaster. The expert city track included a drive through a working docks and had working subway trains going around it. Outrun 2 on the latest Sega Chai Hero board offers a race across 15 unique branching stages, with each area representing a different part of Europe. Its pseudo sequel, Outrun 2 SP, offered an additional 15 brand new stages, this time representing different areas in North and South America. Even the flat shaded 3D polygon great granddaddy of all those games, Sega's very own Virtua Racing, tried to keep things interesting looking, with some suspension bridges, a fun fair, a polygon acropolis and some, uh cows? Midway Games had the right idea too, with some absolutely bonkers settings and things going on in their races, with their powerboat racer Hydro Thunder being my personal favourite, and the Ridge Racer games usually had low flybys from helicopters and stuff like billboards with giant games of Galaxians going on on them. You know what right, I must give credit where credit is due. One of the sim type games I started playing back through in order to get a bit of footage for this was the demo version of Forza Horizon, which I actually downloaded ages ago. And there's a particular showcase race in that, where you're racing against the Italian aerobatic team, so I thought that was a pretty cool little touch. Also I did notice as well on the Spa track on Need for Speed Shift, another demo that I got on the PlayStation 3, you can see a funfair with a little pirate ship at one point. And completely unrelated to any of that, but something that I just thought was quite funny, was I'd completely forgotten that the demo of Project Cars that I've got on the PlayStation 4 is literally the only PlayStation 4 game I've ever played where the little speaker in the DS4 joypad actually talks to you. Good hustle, that's the best second sector of anyone today. It's a shame this feature didn't get added to more games. It actually made me jump a tiny bit the first time it did it. Anywho, I've digressed a bit there. Let's get back to the topic at hand. Over the subsequent years after the release of the first Gran Turismo, a sea change was starting to occur within the driving game genre as a whole. As the sim racer started to increase in popularity, it seemed to have a direct knock-on effect on the arcade racer, as more and more developers moved away from this once beloved style of gaming and started to embrace the world of real-life driving physics. Ugh. And as the arcade racer started to drift, no pun intended there, from the public consciousness, it was starting to seem that as a genre in itself, it was beginning to die off. I mean, we were still getting stuff like the EA Need for Speed games, but to me these always felt more like some kind of sim arcade racer hybrid combining both uninteresting tracks with cars that felt very tankish. And also another major bugbear I had with these titles was that a lot of them quite often seemed to be happy to stick at 30 frames per second. When you had games coming out on previous generation hardware 
that were really pushing the limits of those older consoles with incredible looking 60 frames per second games. People would often cite the death of the arcade racer as being down to the fact that arcade games just didn't have enough content in them, confusing something like the three tracks you'd get in an actual arcade based racer back in the 90s to the amount of content you'd get in a proper console released arcade racer, like for example Ridge Racer 7, a first generation PlayStation 3 game released in 2006 that managed to run at 1080p at 60 frames per second with something like 40 cars in it and 22 courses available in forward reverse and mirrored versions as well as a host of single player modes and online play. But Ridge Racer 7 was an exception though, not the norm and as we proceeded from the mid to the late 2000s and beyond the studios kept pumping out sim racers as the arcade racing genre began to fade into obscurity. But all of a sudden, in 2013, a ray of hope appeared. An independently produced arcade racing title was announced on Kickstarter called the 90s Arcade Racer, created by one man game development studio Pelican 13, aka Antonis Pelicanos. The game's Kickstarter page declared it to be a racing game inspired by the great arcade racers of the 90s, such as Daytona USA, Scud Race and Indy 500, and the early pics of it certainly seemed to back that claim up. They were positively dripping with Sega Blue Blue Sky's style and charm. When the first videos of the work in progress game appeared on YouTube, the visuals looked utterly incredible especially for the work of a single artist and developer rolled into one, managing to nail that Sega arcade racer look down to a T. The tracks were colourful with lots of interesting Sega-esque features on them that were quite clearly homaging some of the great arcade racers of the 90s. The game looked fast too, providing a great sense of speed and clearly hitting that magic 60 frames per second mark that's so important for an arcade racer. I mean, just look at this video yourself. It looks absolutely amazing. This was clearly a project that had been auteured by Antonis, an artist with a distinctive approach with a unique style and focus and a specific vision for how the game should look and play. And this look and style was exactly the sort of thing that I'd been feeling starved of for the last couple of years leading up to this point. An arcade racing oasis in a sea of boring identikit sim racers. So I immediately backed the Kickstarter and pledged £20 to it. The game managed to surpass its Kickstarter funding goal of £10,000, with 700 backers and over £16,000 raised, and it looked like the game was on schedule for its release date of 2014. As a backer of the game, though, I felt that Antonis's rather lackadaisical approach to updates was starting to become a bit frustrating. A lot of updates were apologising to the backers for the length of time and lack of communication since the previous update. It was, to put it bluntly, pretty fucking annoying. But I felt as long as he was working on the game during these long periods of silence and gearing up to that promised release date of 2014, I didn't mind. All good things come to those who wait and all that shite. And the infrequent updates that did occur seemed to suggest that things were going well. But things all went tits up when Antonis decided to involve indie game publisher Nicalis in the project. At first, this sounded like it was going to be a good thing. I'd never heard of Nicalis before, but its founder, a twat named, I'm sorry, a guy named Tyrone Rodriguez mentioned that their collaboration would allow Antonis to realise his vision of the game and make sure that he had the necessary programming and design help needed so that he could concentrate on art and other aspects. Tyrone went on to explain that he grew up playing arcade games and the racing genre had always been one of his favourites, citing Virtua Racing, Daytona 1 and 2 and Scud Race as some of his favourites. He also mentioned that both he and Antonis knew what arcade racers should feel like and generally sounded like he was trying to reassure the game backers that the physics of the game would be just right. Oh, and that the game would now also be appearing on the Wii U as well as the PC. 
In what is probably the least surprising news ever, the game ended up missing its 2014 target, but footage appeared in 2015, which suggested it was still alive and well, and that it wouldn't be too long until we'd be able to play it. Before this, updates had still been infrequent, with one in particular mentioning that Nicalis and Antonis were struggling with the game's physics model and AI. Tyrone's original plan for the game's handling was to try and adapt a realistic driving sim model that they already had into an arcade racer. Unsurprisingly, this terrible idea, akin to me of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, didn't work, and they had to scrap it and go back to the drawing board and try and come up with an arcade racing physics engine from scratch. And then not long after that, it all went radio silent. The last official update on Kickstarter was in November 2015, with a video showing off progress made in the AI and functioning gameplay mechanics. It also went on to state that all gameplay elements are now in and working, and that they were now in the process of polishing, optimising, bug fixing, as well as setting up the two player split screen in a championship mode. At some point before this, Antonis had offered refunds and access to a new side-scrolling beat-em-up he was working on as a compensatory measure for the backers. I never took up either of these offers at the time, as I was still confident the game would eventually get a release. Oh, how naive I was. In 2016, it was revealed that the game would now be skipping the Wii U in favour of the Nintendo Switch and it was now getting a name change to 90 Super GP. This wasn't an official announcement or anything, by the way. This was just something that people had spotted on the Nicalis website. Nicalis would occasionally post some pictures of the game up on Twitter and their Facebook page, but with nothing about an actual release date or progress or anything useful like that. And it would seem that Antonis no longer had any association at all with the game. Nicalis still has the 90 Super GP game page live on its site, with Switch, PS4 and Steam listed as the supported platforms, and soon as the optimistic release date. Things went completely silent again for a few years, until April the 1st 2019, when Nicalis posted a Twitter April Fool's joke stating that Super 90 GP is coming! An April Fool's joke. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, Jesus, tap dancing Christ. How tone deaf can a company be? James Jones, writing on the website Nintendo World Report, sums things up in a far more eloquent fashion than I probably could. 90 Super GP isn't just vaporware, it's vaporware they already took money for from 700 people. To Nicholas, these people are customers customers who paid for this game six years ago. Backing a Kickstarter is inherently a risk. The entire concept of Kickstarter was for small teams of creators to find financing to work on their dream. It isn't an investment, but it isn't supposed to be pure gambling either. But that no longer applies to the 90s arcade racer. Once Nicholas made their involvement known, once this was no longer one man in Greece working on a dream project, this all changed. Nicholas became responsible for bringing this game to market. They put their name on this project. They advertised a platform it would never actually reach. They took this game from a one-man project to a project backed by a successful and established publisher. And as a result, Pelican 13, the one-man development studio, received a 60% surge in backer funding. So where is Super 90's GP? Only Nicholas knows. James goes on to mention that this April Fool's update from Nicalis comes six years after using their name to juice donations. Six years after Rodriguez uses his self-described history as a racing game expert to promise a delivered vision. Three years since any meaningful information. Nicholas decided to leverage the gaming industry's tired meme of April Fool's announcements to make a jaded jab at their own failure to provide updates. All those years you've waited, isn't it funny? It isn't. You said it, mate. It isn't funny, it's downright fucking disrespectful. YouTuber Moriarty, 
made an interesting video theorising about what exactly killed the 90s arcade racer, and it quite squarely pins the blame for the game's lack of release on Tyrone. It also highlights an article by Kotaku, released in September 2019, that highlighted all sorts of shady practices going on at Nicarlis, and paints a pretty damning picture of Tyrone as a stupid, bigoted, egomaniac and terrible manager with a penchant for lying. Moriarty draws to the conclusion that whilst he's probably not entirely faultless in the whole 90s arcade racer debacle, Antonis was most likely hoodwinked by Tyrone, a seemingly respected indie publisher coming on board as a developing partner could have only sounded like a good thing at the time. Interestingly, Moriarty also mentions in his video that a friend of his had posted a comment on Reset Era that they saw a working demo of the game at Anime Expo 2019. Unfortunately, to paraphrase here, they said it played like absolute shite and was not even a racing game anymore with your final position being determined by points you get for drifting. Ew. They also mentioned that the AI was laughable, driving seemingly random racing lines all over the track with no real direction. And just to top it off, the person demoing it on the show floor didn't even seem very proud of it and was actively avoiding answering any questions about it. Oh dear. Something about this that's so weird, well, to me at any rate, is that this one post on Reset Era seems to be about the one and only bit of news of an actual working version of the 90s arcade racer ever being spotted out in the wild, which just seems absolutely crazy to me, given just how big this anime expo was, and how many thousands of people were likely in attendance and also given just how much mystery and internet speculation still surrounds this game. I actually ended up sifting through a few walk-around videos of the show floor at this anime expo in 2019, just on the off chance that some Sailor Moon fan might have unwittingly recorded some gameplay footage of it, but alas I couldn't find anything. The closest I could find was someone who had this fleeting glance at the Nicarlis stand, but I couldn't spot any signs of the 90s arcade racer. In fact, the only evidence of its existence I could find at all was this picture on Twitter, and even then this didn't show up by conventional Google image searching methods. I found a link to it in another video talking about the death of the 90s arcade racer. I mean, trawling through all this anime expo footage once I'd finished getting distracted by all the hot cosplay ladies that is. I was genuinely quite flabbergasted by the size of it. The show floor seemed to go on for miles and miles. And out of the thousands of people that were in attendance, I can't believe that there wasn't a single person who spotted the game and was like, holy shit, it's an actual working version of that mythical arcade racing game. I'm gonna get me some footage of that in action. But I guess maybe that's the difference in my mindset if I were going to something like this. Compared to that to some 16 year old kid who's only there because they want to see people dressed up like their favourite characters from One Piece or Attack on Titan. Who knows, maybe negative consumer feedback at the Anime Expo about the 90s Super GP, as I should probably start referring to it as now, was the final nail in the coffin for it. We can speculate until we're blue in the face and it won't make any difference. The only people that know for definite why the 90s arcade racer has never seen the light of day are Nicarlis and Antonis themselves, and it appears Antonis is unable to comment further on the matter for some presumably legal reason. Everything about this situation is just so bizarre though. I mean, why would Nicarlis just let this amazing looking game languish in development hell like this? Especially after Tyrone waxed lyrical so much about what a huge racing fan he is. Why would they troll the people wanting information about the game, like with that incredibly disrespectful April Fool's gag? I just don't get it. I mean, I guess the simple answer is that Tyrone is just an absolutely massive wanker. 
with absolutely no respect for his customer base, who thought the game just wasn't financially viable or something. But why just go absolutely radio silent on the matter? Does he get off on this feeling of ghosting his consumers or something? So weird. Strangely though, despite the fact I was getting so fucked off with Antonis in the early days of the Kickstarter because of just how fucking useless he was at actually providing updates, I actually now do feel sorta of sorry for him. I mean, I believe at the outset he genuinely had good intentions behind what he was doing. And before Nicholas had stepped in, he'd created a genuinely beautiful looking work of art, which Tyrone then proceeded to take a colossal shit all over, making sure a good dollop of that Nicholas fecal matter smeared itself all over Antonis' reputation in the process. Even if the game were to somehow still magically get a release over 10 years after it was first announced, it feels to me like the name 90s Arcade Racer or 90s Super GP even, has been tarnished now because of Nicholas' shitty attitude towards its customers and the original Kickstarter backers. But what's so frustrating about this entire situation is that even now, after all this time, those gameplay demos that Antonis uploaded running on now obsolete console hardware still look bloody amazing because arcade racers don't need to look photorealistic. They just need a touch of the magic Sega Blue Blue Skies brush with some imaginative and memorable, hopefully 60 frames per second tracks. Add in some dinosaurs, some drive through aquariums, some giant statues of robots, some orcas jumping over the track, some helicopter and jet fighter flybys, some Aztec looking ruins and castles, and you're onto a winner. It's not all doom and gloom though. In the time since the announcement and subsequent death of the 90s arcade racer, a veritable slew of indie studios have picked up the baton and started to develop some arcade racing titles of their own. Even Sega themselves re-released a new modern version of Daytona USA back into the arcades in 2017. But the 90s arcade racer still remains as a unique concept here though trying as it was to emulate something akin to a Sega Model 3 style polygon racer, as most of these new titles seem to fall under the category of either being a pseudo 2D sprite skating game or a virtual racing style flat shaded polygon racer. Now this isn't a bad thing, I just recently uploaded a video saying how impressed I was with the fantastically virtual racing esque looking demo of Super Retro GP by DDI Games. Equally, Super Polygon GP by Ros Games looks like a very impressive title and a true labour of love. Sadly one I can't play properly at the moment as my GPU doesn't meet the minimum specs. And also, falling into a category all of its own, you have Overjump Rally, a full-fledged Sega Rally remake with beautiful, super detailed, ultra-realistic graphics that aims to keep the arcade rate of gameplay intact despite having the sort of visuals that would give Gran Turismo 7 a run for its money. A previously small studio based flat shaded arcade racer that started off in life as a game called Racing Apex actually got a helping hand from genuine big league gaming studio Sumo Digital who stepped in to polish up and publish the game, turning it into the well received arcade racer called Hotshot Racing. A game with virtual racing type aesthetics that actually plays a bit more like Ridge Racer 7. But there currently aren't any indie racers filling in that middle ground that the 90s arcade racers seemed like it would. That era of mid 90s to early 2000s Sega arcade boards. And this is something that I, and I think a great deal of other retro arcade gaming enthusiasts would really like to see. One of the Kickstarter updates from Antoninus claimed that the 90s arcade racer was something like 90% complete. It will never happen, but my dream scenario here would be for Sumo Digital to step in and acquire the rights to the game from Nicarlis, sort the game's handling and AI out and publish it themselves. Whilst we will likely never know how the 90s arcade racer would have actually turned out, one thing I think we can all agree on 
is how gorgeous the game was turning out to be. My hope for the future here is to see an indie team move away from the fake sprite scalers and flat shaded polygons and have a go at producing something that looks on a par with it. So how about it indie developers? Who fancies developing something that looks like it could genuinely be called Outrun 3, Daytona USA 3 or Scud Race 2? You'd be making a lot of gamers of a certain age very happy. Welp, that's all I've got to say on the subject. What are your thoughts on the 90s arcade racer? Were you as gutted as I was that it never came out? Or have you gone beyond caring now? Do you think Tyrone Rodriguez is some kind of deranged tosspot who gets off on making his customers unhappy? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Right, well that's it from me gang. I will catch you again for another video sometime soon. I have been Mr Thundering. Cheerio!